we're good to go. Okay, hi, and thank you everyone for joining us, whether you're in the actual Zoom meeting or by live or by watching it later at your own leisure. Um, I'm very excited to uh, be here today. This is the webinar that is pretty much kicking off uh, the rest of the week's activities uh, for Pollinator Week. This is our first annual Pollinator Week where we celebrate our invaluable pollinator friends. Um, it also will kick off the photo contest um, that our speaker will discuss here in just a few. So without further ado, let me introduce our speaker. James Hung is an assistant professor at the University of Oklahoma, where he heads the Native Pollinator Laboratory at the Oklahoma Biological Survey and Oklahoma Natural Heritage Inventory. James's research focuses on pollinator diversity, conservation and ecosystem services in a world that is increasingly threatened by human impacts. In his spare time, James enjoys being outdoors with his kids, cooking food with his wife, growing vegetables, photo photographing wildlife, and playing violin. James's favorite insects are bees, naturally. And his next favorite insect, or his favorite non-bee insect, is the mole cricket. Dr. Hung, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And I am so excited to share with you a little bit of uh, what I've learned about bees and pollinators in my years of study. Can everyone see um, the screen that I'm sharing right now? I can. Okay, perfect. Um, just to kick us off, there's a beautiful bee photo here. And <clears throat> I will like to mention that um, instead of clogging my presentation with a bunch of self-attribution copyrights, um, photos that are my own or um, in, the, in the Creative Commons uh, uh, clip art domain uh, will not have attributions. I also would like to start that I acknowledge that the land on which the University of Oklahoma now resides was the traditional home of the Hasunai Kado Nation and the Kirikiri Wichita and affiliated tribes. I acknowledge that this territory once also served as a hunting ground, trade exchange point, and migration route for the Apache, the Comanche, the Kiowa, and Osage nations. The University of Oklahoma recognizes the historical connection that our university has with its indigenous community. We acknowledge, honor, and respect the diverse indigenous peoples connected to this land. We fully recognize, support, and advocate for the sovereign rights of all of Oklahoma's 39 tribal nations. Hey, I'm gonna start the presentation by telling you a little bit about myself. That's me. I was born in Taiwan, which had a very, very strict education system. Um, and as someone who has ADHD, I started having issues with uh, schooling starting in actually pre-kindergarten when this photo was taken. Um, and I would get, you know, lots of spankies and corner time every day uh, because of, <clears throat> you know, just acting out, being too curious, too energetic. But thankfully, my mom was able to transfer me to a different teacher uh, in my senior year of kindergarten uh, who recognized that I wasn't just a bad kid who loved making trouble. I just had a hard time uh, standing, uh, staying focused inside this regimented system. So she sent me out to the schoolyard to follow uh, different insects around and report back to her what I observed about their natural history. And so a tiny entomologist was born and I spent the rest of my years in Taiwan catching and observing insects whenever I could. Um, even when I moved to Canada at age 10, I continued to study insects, uh, even when we went on family vacations. And I even roped in my younger brother to be my first field assistant and enlisted my parents as my first research sponsors. So this is a McLeish Specter uh, walking stick insect that my brother and I raised in our basement that my parents allowed us to convert into an insect rearing uh, laboratory. And after high school and college, I pursued my PhD at UC San Diego, where I studied native bee conservation in the endangered coastal sage grub ecosystem. And then I postdoc at The Ohio State University to study how to balance pest control with pollinator conservation on pumpkin farms. That's a big handful of pumpkin flowers uh, that we use for chemical analysis. And then <clears throat> I did a second postdoc at the University of Toronto, studying the pollination of apple orchards. And as of, as of last summer, I'm the newest faculty member of the Oklahoma Biological Survey and Oklahoma Natural Heritage Inventory, where I'm now documenting bees in Oklahoma. All right, so I'm going to start my presentation about pollinators by taking one step back and talking a little bit about plants. So we know that most plants start their lives from seeds, 
And in order to produce seeds, plants need to combine genetic material from a father and a mother, just like us animals. Now, a feature about plants is that they're rooted in place and they can't move. So how do they go about exchanging genetic information with another individual that's far away? Well, they need a system that includes a mobile component. And that mobile component is pollen, which is the male gametophyte of the plant shown here at 500 times magnification. Now, pollen grains are produced by specialized structures in a plant's flower, and their goal in life is to travel to another flower of the same species and fertilize uh, the egg cell, which then can develop into a fertile seed. Now, how does pollen get from one plant to another? Well, a lot of plant species are wind pollinated, including our familiar lawn grasses, uh, our corn, and uh, on the right-hand side, it's a ragweed. Uh, wind pollinated plants are the cause of hay fever, as many of you unfortunately are very familiar with. Um, and hay fever is just wind borne pollen trying to fertilize your nose and your eyes and making your body freak out at this unwanted advance from plants. So as you can imagine, dispensing, dispensing pollen using the wind can be uh, very inefficient and wasteful. So wind pollinated plants need to make lots and lots of it. And so this is a photo of a layer of tree pollen on some poor dude's car windshield and how the dude feels about it. You can imagine that if all plants did this, there will be so much pollen everywhere all the time. So thankfully, most plants are not wind pollinated. And instead, the majority of plant species, about 85% of the known plant species out there, depend on animals for pollination to some extent. And so reproduction for plants it's literally about the birds and the bees and the flies and the beetles and butterflies and moths and bats. And what makes all these different looking organisms great pollinators are several traits that sh they share in common. Um, they have great mobility. They're all strong flyers. Uh, you wouldn't want a caterpillar or an earthworm to carry your pollen, for example. Um, they all have strong sensory abilities that allow them to detect uh, flowers, including being able to discern one species of flower from another in a large landscape, and they all have a reliance on flowers for food. Now, this last point, the reliance on flowers for food, illustrates the fact that pollination relationships between plants and animals are actually more of a mutual exploitation rather than a harmonious partnership where one is uh, seeking the, to benefit the other. Because pollinators are always trying to get the most food they can while putting in the least amount of work, uh, whereas plants are always trying to pay the least amount of nectar and pollen to hire these animals to pollinate them. But um, in, the, in general, the balance of these two selfish sides um, do tend to work out well in this unregulated free market uh, system. So a tremendous amount of biodiversity is sustained and maintained through these selfish partnerships. <clears throat> and in order to attract pollinators, Plants have adapted these beautiful flowers um, that smell great um, or uh, smell great to various different kinds of pollinators um, that signal these tasty rewards that they have for pollinators. Now for animals like us, uh, we like to keep our reproductive organs to ourselves, but for plants, as you can see here, it's just the opposite. As you can imagine, different kinds of flowers are adapted to pollination by different kinds of pollinators. For this inaugural pollinator week lecture for the city of Norman, uh, I will stay in my lane and stick to bees, uh, which are the chief pollinators in our region and across most uh, ecosystems in the world. But in future years, we really hope to um, host lectures by experts and all sorts of other pollinator groups. So you can look forward to that in the, in the years to come. There are about 20,000 species of bees in the world. So for comparison, that's about two known bee species for every known bird species out there. Um, and as you can see from the faces of these 16 native bees that I photographed when I was a graduate student in San Diego, there is an incredible amount of variation and diversity that exists among bees. So we'll be spending the next few minutes on a brief overview on how different bees live their lives. But before that, I'm just gonna pause and very briefly talk about this insect here, our friend, the Western honeybee, which is actually the state insect of our state. Um, this is the insect that most people think of when they hear the word bee, 
Um, and as you know, they live in huge colonies that are headed by a queen. Um, they're working hard all the time to store up tons and tons of sweet honey and, uh, and uh, pollen. And they very aggressively defend these wax honeycomb nests from intruders that are after their honey. Um, if you've ever watched Winnie the Pooh as a child, you would know about this propensity of honeybees. So I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about this species, A, because it's very familiar to everyone, and B, because it is not actually native to North America, but instead it was introduced as a sort of livestock by the first European settlers. Um, and so uh, since it's not native, we won't be focusing on it, um, but instead we will talk about our native bees um, in comparison to what our expectations are for honeybees. Let me show you what I mean. So 96% of the native bee species in the world do not make or store honey. In fact, about 90% of them don't even live in a social colony. About half of the bees that you see out there are incapable of stinging. And about one out of every eight species or so do not make an honest living, uh, do not work hard. So um, this is a surprise to many of you, hopefully, um, which sets the stage for some uh, for some really exciting learning opportunities, I hope. So for the majority of native bee species, their life cycle starts like this, uh, start, starting from the most familiar life stage that um, probably 99.9% .9 of us will ever uh, encounter in the wild. This is an adult bee. Um, a female bee collects pollen from uh, a nectar from flowers that they depend on and they deposit them in underground nest cells that they excavate in a uh, dirt substrate of their choice. Once she collects enough nectar and pollen, she uh, forms a provision ball and lays an egg on it and then continues um, her goal, uh, her work of nest construction and collecting more pollen and nectar to make more provision balls. And in the meantime, male bees are not really doing very much other than flying around chasing females. When the egg hatches, the baby bee, which we call a larva, gets to live one of the cushiest lives of any baby animal out there. So you can, you can see that it has no external body parts that are needed for survival. No hard shell to protect it from predators, no legs to grant it mobility, no eyes uh, to see its surroundings. Um, and that's because it's born in this safe, sealed chamber underground on top of this giant comfy food pillow that contains all the nutrients it needs to grow up healthy and strong. After eating this food pillow, uh, the bee uh, metamorphoses into a pupa. So they go through the same kind of life cycle as our familiar butterfly. They have this suspended animation um, pupa stage. And then the following year or later in the same uh, season, depending on the species, when the conditions are right, uh, the adult bee emerges from the burrow and the process starts again. So what time is the right time to emerge for a bee? Well, that depends on the bee species. Many of our bee species are what's known as pollen specialists, which means that they will only provision their nest with pollen from one family or even one genus of plant. In such cases, uh, the emergence times of these bees are usually closely tied to when their host plant species are in bloom. So for example, here's a ground cherry mining bee um, that only takes pollen from these ground cherry plants. So you'll only see it flying around in the spring when ground cherry is in bloom. Uh, and when seasons change, so do flowers and so do bees. So here's a keel evening bee, which is a sunsp uh, sunflower pollen specialist. So you'll only see it flying in the late summer months. <clears throat> Ground, uh, ground nesting specialist bees also include some of the tiniest bees out in the world. So here is the U4 mini bee, uh, mini fairy bee, which only feeds on the flowers of Cambyscyzae euphorbia sand mats. So if you're familiar with how tiny sand mat flowers are, you have a good idea um, of the astonishingly tiny size of this bee. If you don't know this plant, Here's good old Abe Lincoln for scale. And you can see that this B is a little bit longer than two penny letters in length. Now, given the total dependence of specialist bees on the pollen of their specialized host plants, one would assume that they would be the best, highest fidelity pollinators for their host plants, right? Well, sometimes, but not always the case. So here's a current mining bee, which as its name implies, only forages on current pollen. And this particular individual is foraging on fuchsia flowered current uh, in Southern California. And as you can guess, 
from the red tubular structure of the plant, uh, of the flower, it is primarily pollinated by hummingbirds. Um, and this bee, while it's collecting pollen, oftentimes completely misses the female reproductive structure and, and uh, is therefore often a poor pollinator for the one plant that they depend on. So uh, this is one concrete example where pollinators really are just out after their own, own interests and they don't really care about the kinds of pollination services that they are uh, providing in return. Another common assumption people might make about pollen specialist bees is that they don't have really much relevance for the everyday uh, person. But that's also a misconception because um, specialist bees can be very economically important when they're associated with the right kinds of plants. So here, for example, the squash bee uh, is responsible for pollinating huge portions of the pumpkin and squash crops in North America. So without this plant, Halloween is gonna look a little bit different. All right, so even though I showed you just now a lot of different specialist bee species, um, and indeed specialists make up a sizable portion of the bee diversity in our region, actually the majority of bee species out there are pollen generalists which means that they can forage on pollen from many different kinds of plant species across many different families. This striped sweat bee is one of them, and she's actually pretty impressive in being able to handle and collect and sub, uh, subsist on pollen grains that span more than an order of, of magnitude in size. Okay, here's the last ground nesting bee I'm going to show you today um, in this section. This is a polyester or cellophane bee. And its name comes from the fact that it lines its underground burrow with a waterproof secretion that is similar to cellophane. And what it does is instead of depositing a solid pollen provision ball, it deposits a soupy pollen and nectar slurry um, that, um, that uh, eventually uh, starts bubbling because it ferments. And this, <clears throat> this observation that the soupy uh, secretion of the cellophane bees start fermenting actually inspired scientists years and years ago to hypothesize that um, bees are actually perhaps deriving a lot of their nutrients from microbes that are colonizing their pollen and nectar secretions. Um, and this was ultimately uh, shown to be the case more recently using uh, staple isotope studies um, for many different kinds of bees. So what this means is that bee provision rather than just being straight pollen and nectar is actually kind of a value added product like kombucha or sauerkraut. Um, bees are actually deriving a lot of their nutrients from these microbes um, that, are, that are breaking down the pollen and making the nutrients higher quality and more accessible to, to these animals. So uh, this fact actually puts bees a little bit closer to microbe eaters on the food chain and actually makes them some of the earliest brewing animals that we know about. Now for the bees that don't excavate nests in the soil, most of the other ones nest in wood in cavities left behind by beetles, or um, in some cases they can excavate their own cavities. In this photo here, they're colonizing cavities drilled in wood by scientists who are studying cavity nesting bees. Now, since these bees are not constructing their own homes, but rather they are renting pre-existing space, um, they have to bring in their own furniture. As you can see, some are using leaves, some use resin, um, some will scrape plant hairs and weave a kind of fabric in which to enclose their pollen balls and their babies. So uh, even though these bees are not spending a lot of time on the hard labor of, of excavation and construction, they do have to spend a lot of time uh, scrounging around for these nest building materials and laying them nicely in the nest. Here is one of the cavity nesting bees, a leaf cutter bee carrying a leaf back to her nest. And these leaf cutter bees have special blades on their mandibles that are used for cutting leaves. Um, and sometimes if you go out and you see these nice neat little circles cut, cut out of um, say leaves from your garden, it could very well be the work of these uh, leaf cutter bees. Leaf cutter bees um, and their family members um, actually have a very fun fact, which is instead of collecting pollen using pollen brushes or pollen baskets on their hind legs, they use a pollen brush on the underside of their abdomen. So I like to joke that in the world of bees, it's the ladies who have hairy legs or hairy bellies. Here's another wood tunnel nester. Um, the masked bee, which is also a member of the polyester bee family and also spins these uh, polyester pouches. 
So you can see that it's not very hairy and it doesn't have a pollen brush anywhere on its body. And that's because unique among our bees, it actually swallows pollen grains and then carries it back to their nest and then regurgitates it. And uh, also because it nests in very uh, narrow tunnels, it's very cylindrical, very streamlined. Um, it's not round and fuzzy like many of our other bees. Um, so bees like these um, are a good reminder that bees are actually classified by biologists as a vegetarian branch of the family tree of wasps. Now, as I mentioned earlier, some bees can drill their own holes in wood, like this large carpenter bee here, which is uh, about the size of a grape, um, very large animals. <clears throat> because of this habit, uh, because of this habit, these bees can sometimes become pests when they drill holes in our uh, wooden structures like lawn furniture. And actually this ability to excavate holes out of solid wood actually can make them pests to certain plants as well because they can use these powerful jaws to chew holes in these uh, long tubular bird pollinator flowers and rob nectar that they're not supposed to be able to access by legitimate means that actually cause pollen transfer uh, like this one is doing here. So again, this demonstrates the utilitarian and selfish relationship between plants and pollinators. Now here's a carpenter bee nest showing the cushy lives of the carpenter bee larvae. You can tell that the nests were constructed from left to right um, as you know, the larva on the left side has almost completed its eating its pollen ball. Um, the larva on the right side um, has just started not long ago. And one thing that's really cool about this photo is you can see um, the divisions between the nest cells that the, uh, that the carpenter bee uh, makes out of sawdust from its next nest excavation activities mixed with secretions and nectar. So for all you carpentry nerds out there, here's a fun fact of the day. The carpenter bee is the true inventor of the particle board. Here's a close relative of the large carpenter bee, a small carpenter bee, which also excavates um, pithy stems. Um, this is again a, a streamlined and sleek and pretty shiny bee that's difficult to tell apart from a wasp unless you know what you're looking at. Um, but they do carry pollen on their fuzzy hind legs. So that's a, a slight giveaway. Now, one thing that's really interesting about this particular group of bees is that many species have a system where the mother bee will raise uh, her first daughter to be um, a malnourished dwarf that really doesn't have much ability to survive on her own. And the mother will bully this uh, eldest dwarf daughter into helping to forage to feed her younger siblings. So um, this poor elder daughter generally doesn't get to make her own nest and have her own offspring. So it's kind of like a, a real life Cinderella story where unfortunately the prince never comes. But before you get too sad for this uh, Cinderella bee, um, you should know that all of her hard work uh, is instrumental to the survival of her little siblings. So even though she's sacrificing her own reproduction, she is passing on her genes through her siblings, which could share up to 75% of their DNA with her. Um, and that's because of the unique sex determination of bees and actually all um, members of the wasp uh, family tree. Uh, and in this system, females have two sets of DNA, like me and you, but males only have one set of DNA. Um, so um, the dad bee always provides identical copies of his entire genome to all of his uh, children. Um, and in fact, all of his daughters, because male bees are born from unfertilized eggs. So in this bizarre world of bees, boy bees always have a mom, but no dad but always has a maternal grandfather. So think about that. Now, remember I mentioned that uh, only 10% of bees are social. This seems like very little based on what we know about honeybees uh, and bumblebees, uh, but uh, it is a very, very high number in the world of insects. And scientists believe that this elevated DNA sharing between siblings, you know, this up to 75% DNA in common may be one of the reasons that so many bee species live this social life. Now, the bumblebee, as I mentioned just now, is probably the most familiar social bee that's native to North America. Uh, unlike honeybees, they have a much messier system of building their colony. Um, and also unlike honeybees, their colonies are annual, which means that every year, a new queen um, starts a colony from scratch. Um, they, are, they are truly hardworking single moms um, that build the nest without any help from 
uh, from any worker bees. And she only really gets to kick back and relax a bit more when she successfully raises her first few daughters uh, to then act as workers. Uh, and because of this life cycle, bumblebees uh, around the world are facing many different kinds of uh, threats and declines. Uh, because if you think about it, the bumblebee queen has to find enough resources find uh, to survive, find a place to build a nest, find enough resources to feed her first few offspring, and then the nest has to thrive throughout this whole long season until the nest is strong enough to then start producing new reproductives, queens and males. These new queens need to fly out, mate, um, get enough resources themselves to fatten up to survive uh, a hibernation period. And then the next year, they have to come out of hibernation at the correct time to then find a nest. So um, this kind of complicated life history does introduce several, var uh, several variables and vulnerabilities that cause many of the bumblebee species around the world to be threatened, including, unfortunately, here in Oklahoma, our very own Southern Plains bumblebee. Now, other than bumblebees, um, the only other native bee species in our region that are truly social are all in the sweat bee family. And they're so-called because they'll land on people on a hot sunny day and lick sweat to get water and electrolytes from us, like this one is doing. Now, I mentioned that um, about half of the bees you see out there are incapable of stinging. And that's because um, half of the bees out there are males like this handsome guy here. So the stinger of bees is actually made from the modified egg laying organ, the ovipositor, which means that boy bees that do not lay eggs will lack this organ and therefore be incapable of stinging. And actually on the topic of stinging, I want to mention that um, even though female bees can sting uh, for the most part, there are some species that lack this ability. Um, but even though most female bees carry a stinger, they are very reluctant to, to sting humans unless um, we actually go and like grab them in our hands. Um, what they really wanna do is be out there uh, be efficient in collecting their pollen and nectar, and then fly back to their nest to continue construction, uh, continue depositing pollen and nectar to make these provision balls. So when you're out there um, and you see bees flying around, you really don't have to be too nervous about getting into tussles with them because they also don't want to get into fights with giant bipedal warm-blooded monsters like me and you. Now, what's this fact about not working hard and making an honest living? How do bees provision for their babies if they don't make work hard to make nests and collect food? Well, the answer is they can invade the nest of a different bee species and deposit their own egg on a ready-made uh, pollen provision ball. And when their baby hatches, they'll eat the host bee's egg and then take over the pollen ball for itself. Now, bees with this life cycle are often called cuckoo bees, which makes sense um, because this is the same kind of life history that cuckoo birds have. Uh, in bees, this is called um, kleptoparasitism, and um, it is a pretty common lifestyle across many branches of the uh, of the bee family tree. Um, despite the fact that you know they are very diverse, um, I feel like they all have several things in common. Um, you know, they all have. Uh, they all have lost their pollen collecting structures and nest excavating structures. And they look a lot more like their ancestral wasps than like other bees. Um, and I also feel like they all kind of look evil, like they're up to no good. Um, like this one here, just rubbing her hands while thinking of some sort of diabolical plan. Um, now you may imagine that this kind of marauding lifestyle where you just break and enter and, um, you know, have your way with your host bees nest is carefree living and it's, it's much easier than working hard, honestly. But that's not always the case because this lifestyle really does confine you to having to survive where your host bee is abundant. Uh, you can't make it as a kleptoparasite unless there are bees to parasitize off. And also you do run some risks like this um, morning bee here that is forcibly being ejected from the premises when the host bee returned to the nest and saw it lurking around. 
at any rate, I'm going to conclude the diversity portion of our talk uh, because it's going to take all day to tell you all the cool natural history tidbits about all the different kinds of bees we have here. Um, so this will just be a nice sneak preview for you all and hopefully um, you will get the opportunity to enjoy many native bees in the natural areas around you. Um, as we approach the summer, there's going to be lots and lots of plants that are going to be coming into bloom um, uh, along the roadsides and city parks hopefully even in your garden. So uh, hopefully you'll get to see many of them. Now I promised to talk a little bit about bee conservation. So as, as you know, organisms will get wiped out when we destroy or degrade their habitat. So the more habitat we can preserve in pristine condition, of course, the better. Uh, in many places I've lived, urban development and large scale row cropping are the primary threats to conservation of bees and all sorts of other organisms. Here in Oklahoma, as I'm sure you're familiar with, um, these two uh, processes are less of a pressing issue because of our relatively lower population density um, and the fact that our ecoregion isn't as uh, amenable to large-scale row cropping as uh, places farther to the north. Um, but still, we do have things that are uh, threatening to damage our biodiversity including encroachment of grasslands by trees like, uh, like the calorie pear tree and eastern red cedar, um, because we no longer have bison uh, ranging over the prairies, removing the seedlings of these trees, and we have altered the fire regime that used to clear out these uh, encroaching trees as well. We also have problems with overbrowsing of understories um, by deer, um, which uh, could remove a lot of uh, blooming plant species from forest understories and therefore starve out the bees. And we also have, um, you know, quite an extensive haying uh, industry here. So all of these processes, you know, while perhaps not as serious as transforming large portions of, of the habitat into uh, paved cities or monoculture crops, um, these are still things that could threaten our biodiversity and we should aim to address these when it comes to um, bee conservation and conservation of all sorts of other organisms. Another big threat to biodiversity conservation, not just in our region, but worldwide, is climate change. So we've all heard about global warming, um, but that's just one aspect of climate change. Uh, we also have things like extreme climate events, like droughts and floods and um, unseason unreasonable Reasonable, unseasonable ice rains um, that destroy plants that have already broken uh, dormancy and started putting out uh, flower blood, uh, flower buds. And um, you know when these things happen, our whole ecosystems suffer, and of course our pollinators as well. So these are the kinds of events that we'll need to keep a close eye on uh, going forward. All right, so I mentioned in my talk title that we're going to talk a little bit about how to save the bees. So I'm going to share some things that I think um, everyday members of the community can do. I think the easiest target for us here in Norman is probably lawns. Um, I don't think I've been to any city so far that have as many lawns as we do. Um, so, you know, I, I, I know we all like beautiful grass. I love watching my kids play around the grass too. But I just think, you know, we can use uh, this kind of uh, human-made habitat in more moderation uh, because uh, manicured lawns contribute very little to food resources for bees. Um, and the chemicals that we're using to treat lawns for weeds can also um, be harmful for wild plants as well as wild insects like bees. So if we can swap out some of our lawns for wildflower plantings, that could make urban landscapes a lot more hospitable. Um, flowering plants in general will be great, but it's really the plants that are native to our specific area that will be most helpful for conserving a large diversity of bees and other pollinators. And if you try to take action on this front, you won't be alone. There are many initiatives out there to help you transition your lawn into a biodiversity conservation unit, like this yard by yard project that offers some great resources. Um, the other thing, another thing you can do is uh, be informed about what save the bees means. So as you may guess now, after hearing um, much of my presentation, um, most of the time when people say save the bees, they really mean save our managed honeybees. 
Now, I'm not anti-honeybee. I actually uh, enjoy working with this species and I have a lot of respect uh, for all the things that they do, um, just as a species, but also for the human race. But I think honeybees really have taken not just the lion's share of food from many of the ecosystems to which they have been introduced, but also the public's attention and funding efforts and political clout. Um, despite the fact that the honeybee is literally the least endangered pollinating insect in the entire world. Uh, there's no pollinator under less threat than the, than the Western honeybee that um, just has so much human support. So we should be aiming to support not just the honeybee um, managed by beekeepers, that's an important thing to do, but we also need to be shunting conservation efforts towards targeting our native pollinators. So next time, if a friend asks you to help save the bees, you can turn around and ask them which bees and then teach them all about our native bees. Now on the topic of knowing what bees to save, here's a rough map of how many bee species are known in some uh, areas across the US. So many states in our region, the Great Plains region, have not had any appreciable inventories done. So uh, we don't really know much about them. Um, and Oklahoma is, is you know, right here uh, among those states where very little bee information is available. So right now, the list of confirmed bee species is a little over 300 species deep, but experts who have worked in this region uh, estimate that we may have, you know, as many as up to seven or 800 different bee species out there. So, you know, more than half of the bee diversity remains yet to be documented for our state. And that makes sense, um, you know, in terms of how many species there are, because we have so many ecoregions packed into a tight space here in Oklahoma. With 12 ecoregions in our state, we are tied for second place with Texas, and we're only one ecoregion uh, behind California, which is famous for biodiversity. So with all these areas coming together, we are a true biogeographical crossroads that brings together species from many, many different lineages. But like I mentioned, uh, there has been very little bee sampling in Oklahoma and the records that are available in these uh, public biodiversity repositories, uh, almost half of the counties of our state have fewer than 10 records available. Those are the counties that are colored here in white. Um, and as you can see, many counties have no public data available on what bee species exist there. And data on other pollinator species really aren't all that much better. So this is another place where you can come in and help. You can help uh, fill in the gaps by photographing pollinators and uploading them to the community science platform called iNaturalist, uh, which can help biologists like myself keep track of pollinator populations in ways that we could never do before. Um, as you can imagine, there are only a handful of biologists in any region that's trained in monitoring pollinators. And we can't be doing this every day of the year and we can't be everywhere at once. But if community members can take photos of pollinators whenever you encounter them uh, on your own property, in parks, along, the, along a street, uh, and if you upload them, these records can really help us to uh, give us valuable data on what pollinators are flying, um, where, at what times of the year, and what kinds of plants they are using to sustain their populations. To coordinate this effort, I've set up the Oklahoma Bee Atlas project on iNaturalist, where your data will actually automatically get counted towards the total number of bee species for our state, um, unless you, of course, choose um, explicitly not to share your data with scientists who are working on projects. But I think iNaturalist defaults to, um, to saying, here, yes, yeah, I will share my data with other people who, who need to use it for conservation purposes. So uh, I would encourage you to check out this platform and give it a try. And as an incentive, speaking of projects on iNaturalist, we're using this website as well to host, uh, hopefully the uh, now the annual pollinator photography contest that will be part of our pollinator week events here in Norman. Uh, there will be all sorts of prizes for winners of various categories. And uh, there will be announcements on this uh, later on the Green Norman website um, where there'll be more details. So for those of you who haven't used iNaturalist before, the process is pretty easy and I'm gonna give a very quick rundown on how to do it. So um, go to iNaturalist.org and you can make an account and then go to the search bar and search up uh, Pollinator Week BioBlitz. A BioBlitz is just an event where um, everyone goes out and documents as many organisms uh, in a group as possible. So Pollinator Week BioBlitz, Cleveland County, Oklahoma. And you click about 
which will take us to the project site. Then click join the project. Scroll down and say, yes, I want to join. Um, wait for it to load. And then uh, you're in the project. Then you can go click the green upload button. Go pull out some photos from your computer and just drag and drop into the upload interface. Click select all, go to the left, go to projects, and then you can add these uh, uh, these uh, submissions to the Pollinator Week BioBlitz project. And then uh, for each of your entries, you should uh, make a guess as to what your pollinator is. And if you're not sure, uh, which is totally fine, you can just write insects or birds or whatever your pollinator might be. And the community members on iNaturalist will tell you what they are. Oh, and I should also mention that uh, you should be submitting um, these, you should be double checking to make sure that the date and time are correct on these submissions and also that the locations are correct. So if you are using your phone, um, as long as you turn on the geo uh, geotagging function on your phone, it should automatically log where you are. But sometimes you just, sometimes um, I find that my phone gets the wrong location. So uh, it'll be good to check. Um, and I don't have time to show you how to do that today, um, but uh, iNaturalist will tell you that uh, if you're submitting observations that don't have dates or locations like this warning that just popped up here. Um, you can choose to ignore it and just click continue uh, or go back and fix that. So once the observations are saved, uh, you will have submitted your entries into the uh, pollinator uh, BioBlitz contest and we will announce sometime next week who the winners are. All right, so for those of you who uh, are interested in participating either just in the photo contest or in um, helping us biologists track pollinator populations and monitor them, uh, I have some useful tips for you that uh, at least I myself have found to be useful. One is whenever you're out somewhere where you could encounter a pollinator, uh, carry your camera with you. Most of the photos I showed you today of you know, cute bees are taken either with a, um, with a mid-tier point and shoot camera that's at least three or four years old. At the time that I've taken the photos, um, the camera last I used for some of these photos are, uh, it was purchased more than 10 years ago now. Um, a lot of these other photos like this one here was taken with a cell phone camera um, for uh, on a phone that I bought in 2017. So cameras uh, on phones are getting really good. So if you have your phone with you, um, that's great. If not, if your phone doesn't take good, good photos, you can carry a point and shoot in your pocket. Um, get familiar with plants that pollinators like. So oftentimes, um, if you see a plant that has a large attractive flower, you can spend some time there to see if pollinators are also being attracted to it. Sometimes ornamental plants in your garden, uh, like hydrangeas have beautiful petals, but uh, not a lot of resources for the pollinators to eat. So those will be less popular. So um, the best way to know what plants pollinators like is to take a look at them and see what pollinators are visiting. Um, it's helpful to find busy plants. And what I mean by that is plants that have a lot of pollinators uh, on it, uh, because it's difficult to go out uh, to a less uh, popular plant and just wait for pollinators to show up. Um, but if you go to a plant that already has lots of pollinators, even if you scare off a bunch, um, there may be more that, that come back later that you can then photograph. Spend some time observing small flowers. So this plant here um, is uh, Texas croton, and it really doesn't grow very high off the ground. The flowers also don't look huge and attractive, um, but it is the host of this um, croton fairy bee, which is a beautiful, beautiful bee. Um, so um, spend some time on small flowers that may be overlooked if you get the opportunity. And also look for preoccupied pollinators. So here, this female uh, fairy bee is carrying a male on her back and therefore uh, does not have quite the mobility to immediately fly away when I uh, took this photo. So pollinators that are, um, that are busy uh, cleaning itself or collecting nectar or pollen or mating, these are pollinators that uh, are likelier to sit still long enough for you to take a photo. I would say shoot as you approach and shoot until the pollinator leaves. So as you can see from this series of photos on this mining bee, um, the first photo, her face is covered. The second photo, um, part of her abdomen is co covered. But uh, eventually I was able to get close enough to get a nice photo with no uh, dead, uh, dead flower stalk covering the bee. Um, 
And if you look into my phone, phone's uh, raw photos, you'll see that sometimes I take 30, 40 photos of the same bee on the same flower, um, starting from very far away and then closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and then too close. And then the next shot uh, is a blurry photo of the pollinator departing the flame because uh, the frame because I got too close. Um, you know, just keep shooting and hopefully one of these will turn out nice. Also try to take photos from different angles. Um, this is helpful if you want to know what pollinator your, um, you have photographed because um, scientists need to see an insect uh, from different angles in order to tell you exactly what species it is. So even if some of the angles are not the most photogenic for the bee, uh, try to upload them along with the rest of your photos as well so that, excuse me, so that um, we have a, a better chance of being able to identify exactly what it is so we can properly track its populations. Um, also document interesting behaviors. So this is a pollinator. Uh, this is a cellophane bee leaving his natal nest. Um, and this, I was able to capture this because I happened across a nest aggregation of, of hundreds of these bees emerging out of the ground at the same time. So, um, so it's really great to get pollinators on flowers, but it's also really great to, to get shots of pollinators doing other things in their life history um, that could be uh, lesser known or less frequently documented. And I definitely have seen cases where uh, my friends have documented very novel behaviors um, just by submitting photos of, of pollinators doing interesting things uh, to iNaturalists and, um, and professional biologists have got, gotten in touch with them to let them know that like, this is the first time anyone has documented this kind of behavior um, on film. Lastly, um, if you have access to a spot that has great flowers, if you go there regularly, um, you'll find that you get better and better at uh, identifying the pollinators that are there. Uh, you get better and better at knowing what plant species will uh, attract the pollinators. And uh, you'll be able to contribute rare longitudinal data um, to, our, to our monitoring efforts because we'll have data, hopefully, um, from the same place as spring transitions into summer and then into fall. Um, and having that kind of continuation from the same location is very helpful for monitoring. Oh. Uh, Finally, uh, photos do not need to be perfect. So this photo of this uh, spurred minor bee is, is pretty blurry, but um, biologists who are familiar with this group can actually probably tell you um, what group, um, what species, or at least what uh, species group this thing belongs to. Um, and you, you, know, you never know what blurry photo could actually be uh, informative versus not informative. So I would say, you know, as long as you can tell what the insect is, um, don't hesitate to upload it. The worst that can happen is we say, it looks like a bee, but I can't tell you what it is. Um, and lastly, I just want to say that community science is really becoming a more and more accepted um, form of data collection, even among main, mainstream biologists. And now we get papers um, in the scientific literature um, every year, uh, multiple papers every year that have used data from iNaturalist and other community science platforms to make important discoveries and make important conservation um, um, decisions and so on. Uh, partnering with, with uh, everyday community members who are just out there documenting uh, biodiversity in their neighborhoods or on their travels. So um, I really would encourage everyone to do this. And you know, if you look at this photo, it's a beautiful bumblebee foraging on a desert chicory flower. Um, you get the bee, you, you see what she is doing, you get the plant that she is foraging on, um, and you don't have to you know, spend money to buy a pin. You don't have to kill this bee, put it on a pin and enter it into a database and then have this specimen take up space in a museum. Um, this kind of digital specimen where, you know, for all I know, this bee, uh, which I observed early in May, she could still be out there flying around collecting pollen and feeding her little sisters in her colony. So um, I, I really am hoping that community science will catch on as technology gets better and better for us to be able to use this as a means for uh, tracking and monitoring uh, our pollinators and other organisms too. And lastly, you know, I just think it's, it's really great if a community can take conservation and stewardship of their precious biological resources into their own hands. Um, and this is one way through which community members really can be intimately involved in that process.
All right, I have lots of people and entities to thank for um, supporting my research and conservation work and outreach education work. Um, so thanks very much for all these people and agencies. And with that, uh, that's the end of my talk. And I'd be very happy to take any questions um, from the attendees here. And uh, for those of you who are watching this at a later date, my email address is below. So please feel free to send me any questions you have on bees and other pollinators. Thank you so much, Dr. Hung. This was amazing. Um, additionally, uh, guys, if you do have any questions, those of you who are on the Zoom, go ahead and type them in the chat and um, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and give them to Dr. Hung that way. Uh, we'll give you a couple of minutes if you have uh, any questions to get those into the chat. Um, I was really impressed. Thank you so much. I learned a whole lot that I had no idea about, especially with our bee friends. Oh, thank and, you so and much. only 50% sting. How about that? That's really nice. Um, <laughs> yeah. And also, thank you for the photographic technique trip uh, tips, because I'm going to try to do this too. And oh, I agree great. that yeah. um, this kind of, of uh, uh, online data can help with science so much. Yes. Um, yeah. I also want to point out to uh, all the viewers that the list of activities for this week and also opportunities for you to get your camera out and take pictures while you're at certain sites uh, is listed on greennorman.org. Um, we'll also have more information on the contest that Dr. Hung uh, is leading. Uh, the links to iNaturalist and to the uh, actual contest are already there. Um, and iNaturalist also has an iPhone app if you want to download it and use it that way too. Um, so I'm going to check in the chat. And I'm not seeing any questions. I see a question from David. Um, oh, okay. Who asked, oh, it must be uh, directly to you. Could yeah. you read it out loud? And yes, then David wants to know, do you want pollinator data through BioBlitz from other counties or just Cleveland County? That's a great question. So um, for the photographic contest, uh, we are tracking just pollinator week, just Norman. So the hope is that every year we can have this contest where everyone goes out, um, you know, the, the same week in June and photographs every pollinator they can see. And then we can have this year after year um, series of data from you know, from central Oklahoma, where the different, for many different kinds of climate and, uh, and um, uh, ecosystems meet up. Um, and then we can, we can see, you know, year after year, what's happening with our climate and how is that impacting our pollinators. So we're just limiting that particular photo contest to Cleveland County. But um, if you take photos of pollinators from anywhere else, you can still upload them to iNaturalist as just part of iNaturalist's um, goal to capture biodiversity data all over the world. Uh, and if any of your uh, photos were taken, are taken A, in Oklahoma, and B, features a B, um, they will automatically get subsumed into the Oklahoma B Atlas, and we'll be able to use those data to track populations of bees in our state. Awesome. That's a great question. Thanks. All right. Any others? I'm not seeing any others. Do you have any others? I'm not Dr. seeing any others either. So. Okay, yeah. well, thank you again so much. I really appreciated it. And I absolutely agree with you that hopefully next year we can have several webinars on different species. That'll be really great. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, you're very, very well-versed in bees and I love that and I love your passion for it. Um, thanks Thank you, everybody Michelle. for joining us and I hope you will participate in the photo contest uh, and join us at what are more activities this week. Thank you so yeah. much. Make sure to check out the website. Bye. Bye everyone.